Greetings, salutations. How is everybody? Woo! All right. My name is John Mark Walker. I'm the Gluster Community Lead, and I'm going to talk to you all about Gluster stuff. Uh, this is also Caleb Keithley. He may or may not speak, depending on how shy he is, so we'll see. No, I, I joke. I'll, I'm probably going to end up talking so much he's not going to get a word in, so, but we'll see how that goes. Uh, how many of you have used Gluster before? All right. How many of you still use Gluster every day? <laughs> Some smaller subset of people. Uh, how many of you have used other stuff? In addition, <laughs> but like say, how many of you have used like say Ceph? Okay, interesting. Um, what? What's the last thing? Ceph, um, how many of you use, uh, use like commercial equivalents like maybe GPFS or, uh, okay. I'm sorry to see that, but yes, sure. Um, so for those of you who sounds like everyone has at least heard of it, um, or in, if not tried it in the past, it's a distributed file system. Uh, it's been around for about six or seven years, and it's been uh, pretty tried and tested in the world of scale-out NAS. And that's really what, it's, what we focused on the last two or three years was uh, figuring out the, the, the scale-out NAS um, use case. And so that's kind of like the most uh, mature piece of the code. But what I'm going to talk about today is sort of where we've been, uh, where we fit in with the, the uh, trends in the data center and where we're going, um, how we're broadening beyond just scale-out NAS, uh, where we're going into object storage, we're going to HDFS complementary uh, systems, how we're going into... Uh, all sorts of newfangled things, including uh, VM image hosting and an integration with QMU, which is coming up in the next release, and I'll get into that for you. So, oh, yeah. I love it when I talk over my own slide. Um, so, what's happening in the data center today? How come, uh, why are these changes? Uh, I think, as I've said that many times whenever I give this talk, I think we've seen the last proprietary piece of software that gains ubiquity in the enterprise. Quick, in the last 12 months, name me one proprietary piece of software that's, that's gained, uh, achieved anything of, of note in the data center. Last 24 months, 36 months. It really, it's not since VMware has a proprietary piece of software gained significant traction in the data center. And I don't think we're going to see that anymore. I think from now on, it's all open source all the time. When you look at things like virtualization, automation, uh, the, the pieces that make up what we call cloud. Um, all these point to and are, respond best to uh, systems where you've been able to set up uh, open source, where you've been able to use open source software uh, almost exclusively, where you've been able to set up systems that allow you to iterate quickly to be as agile as possible. And the old model just doesn't work in that framework. You can't expect to depend on your vendor to supply you proprietary software and to be able to achieve what you need to achieve when you have to change, you know, say every two weeks, when you have to deploy a new application uh, as quickly as you need to. Um, other, you know, proprietary vendors, they can't respond to you as quickly as you need. And this is why open source has achieved the ubiquity it has in the data center. Um, so, simple economics. Economics point into one simple direction, or at least the, the vectors align, uh, the vectors of virtualization and automation uh, and open source going in the, in the same way. Uh, if you look at who have been the winners of the last 10 years, you know, the people, who, the companies that have won have been the ones that have uh, bet their business on open source. The Googles, the Salesforces, the Amazons, all of them have built out Netflix now. Netflix is a huge uh, open source player. Um, all of these guys have based their business and their development model on open source. And it's had very clear results, very clear uh, uh, benefits for them. Uh, what is open source? Just, I don't think I'd spend too much time on this slide with you guys, but uh, you know, we're talking about that sort of the land of uh, where you can basically try anything. Um, the open source model that, that we've adopted in the Gluster community is that in the open source piece, anything goes. It's the place where innovation happens. It's a place where people have the freedom to fail and where we can learn from that failure. And then by learning from that failure, we can have a downstream product that, that works better. And in this... Uh, in this graphic, I have Red Hat Storage as one of the downstream products, but there are others. There are other companies who base products on GlusterFS, not just Red Hat. And one of the things that uh, we want to achieve in this community is to really make Gluster 
uh, bigger than Red Hat. We want to be inclusive. We have a big tent. We want other companies to form an ecosystem around this and to, uh, to join the party. Um, as you can see, we're a, we're a global community. I think we are the, the most widely used distributed file system in the world. Um, I would love to have some hard numbers to back that up someday. Uh, it's interesting to see how we started, um, because in the beginning, we weren't a storage company. We didn't set out to be a storage company. And oh, by the way, I, I was part of Gluster when we were acquired by Red Hat. Uh, but what we started out as was a group of cluster engineers who produced HPC management software. And the storage thing just sort of happened uh, on the side. But really what we wanted to do was create uh, free software for managing clusters for, for HPC environments. Um, you can sort of see like that approach manifests itself in, in how GlisterFS was formed. We, we don't have the same baggage, for example, as say, you know, someone who had more experience with file systems has. Um, so we're able to adopt a unique approach, as you'll see later. At the same time, you know, from looking at our code, you can clearly see that it wasn't created by file system experts. So, right, Caleb? <laughs> Caleb's an engineer, so uh, he might be offended by that. Um, necessity is the, the mother of invention. So while we were not doing storage, we were doing these custom HPC projects. We were your typical cash-strapped startup. And so an opportunity came along in South America with an energy company there. And uh, they said, hey, we ha really have a problem with our storage. It's in tape. We need it to be faster than, than tape. Uh, we need to be distributed so that you can add more um, uh, space to it as needed. Uh, can you help us? And being the cash strap startup that we were, we said, sure, of course. Uh, as any cash strap startup will say, uh, yes, yes, I'll take your money. Uh, how long do I have? Six months. Okay, fine, we'll do it. Uh, the thinking was that we could use something off the shelf and be able to put together a solution uh, in a minimal amount of time, not realizing that the stuff that was off the shelf didn't work. Either, it, either the open source stuff that we tried would not scale large enough uh, because they, at the time, there were only, um, uh, the software at the time required a metadata server, which limited how much you could scale out. So the, the scaled approach was limited um, by that uh, a hard limit of, of memory usage by the metadata server. Or if you're talking about proprietary systems, you're talking about uh, something that just would not, uh, you know, a cash strap startup cannot make money uh, by reselling, say, a, a SAN. So they said, well, well, we'll write it from scratch. And that's how GlusterFS was born. We had six months, has to be faster than tape, has to be able to scale out to you know, multiple petabytes. How do we do that? Luckily, the, the, the performance benchmark was faster than tape. That's kind of the key thing there that allowed them to succeed. And while they're going through this process, they realize that you know, storage doesn't need to be complicated. It shouldn't be. You know, and these, these uh, proprietary companies that were producing SANs that were making these combination uh, hardware and software black boxes, <coughs> complexity was built into their business model. Like their business model relied on them being so exceedingly complex that you needed an army of consultants to come in and help you install and maintain it over time. And they thought, that's a bad idea. Installing software should be just like deploying any other app in your data center. You should be able to install your software and just go. And that's how simple it should be. It should be simple to maintain. It should be low risk, all that good stuff. It was sort of like the aha moment when they, th when they thought, well, maybe we will be a storage company because no one else is doing it right. What is simple storage? So as I mentioned, it's, it's low risk. And by low risk, I mean you should be able to install it as well as uninstall it without losing your data. Just because you decide you don't want to use the software doesn't mean you should lose access to your data. I think we can all think of uh, some software that, that isn't as low risk is that. Um, it should be easy to deploy and administer. You shouldn't have a, to have an army of consultants just to get it going or keep it working. Um, we thought very early on that we should be open source. Uh, we, we felt very strongly that from, about that from the beginning. Um, and we're very, very, we were very, very uh, um, uh, on board with the concept of the, so the whole sort of software-driven data center before that became a, a thing. Um, we thought storage is a software problem. Um, when you look at how you're going to be able to 
you should be able to just aggregate data on commodity hardware, and the software should be intelligent enough to know what to do with it. And then the last one is user space. One of the, um, the co-founders of the project, A.B. Periosomy, used to be one of the uh, contributors of the GNU Herd project. How many of you know what GNU Herd is? Yeah. Yes. How many of you have actually used GNU Herd? <laughs> Nobody. No one ever has used GNU Herd. So, um, but one of the things he learned from that was how to create this sort of user space system that sits around a, a central uh, scheduler and is able to implement all these things as translators, uh, stackable translators in user space. And that's how GlissDFS is implemented. It was, a, it was a design decision that was very much borrowed from GNU Herd. And it seemed to work pretty well in this case. So what is GlissDFS when you really get down to it? Uh, it's, it's a distributed storage system. Um, it's, it's user space. It's stackable. We, as I mentioned, we borrowed from GNU Herd. We have the, the stackable translators where we implement every feature. Um, you can remove or add features as you want. You can develop your own features using the translator APIs. Um, all very, uh, uh, in concept, very simple. Um, and then the first half of our existence, it was really about building out this Lego toolkit for building storage systems. And then after that, we focused really heavily on the sort of scale-out NAS piece, making the POSIX compliant stuff work as, as well as posix -y stuff can, uh, making sure that that use case was repeatable so we could actually gain customers, because in the first couple of years, we are really focused on building out the sort of development model, and then after that, we were focused on sort of winning over customers. As we evolve now, we're kind of going back to that original point of being, building more of a developer community, focusing not so much on scale at NAS because that, that's been done, but making sure that we have a platform that's able to expand beyond just the scale at NAS use case and all these other you know, high uh new technologies like uh, something you know, S3-like object storage, uh, HDFS, um, VM image storage, all that sort of thing. Some of the things, the features that we built out uh, in order to uh, fulfill the obligations of the, the scale at NAS use case. So you'll see where I say um, no single point of failure in DHT. I mentioned before that a lot of the other solutions at the time used metadata server or metadata services and that we had avoided that entirely. And the way we did it was we created, um, there was a concept called DHT, distributed hash table. And we sort of modified that, and we call it elastic hashing. And what we did was we implemented a translator that allows you to store bitwise hashes into the extended attributes of every file and directory so you can sort of map out where the data goes for your, when you're reading and writing. Um, traditionally, what you do is you separate the metadata from the data, from the file data, and you have a central repository of all the metadata, and then you have to keep track of that between, you know, which files the metadata refers to. In this method, you don't have to do that at all. Uh, all you have to do is be able to make a quick calculation of what the, um, what the hash is, and then you can go out and find it, uh, regardless of which uh, server it's stored on. So that's how we do that. Um, so that's the distributed. Um, so you can distribute over uh, any number of servers at, at a time. You can also replicate the entire volume. And it essentially functions as mirroring, uh, where you can have um, replication up to as many replicas as you want, theoretically, although really we recommend you stick with uh, two or three. Um, and then the, the basic replication is uh, synchronous, so it, it doesn't finish writing until it finishes in all replicas and then it returns. But we also have an asynchronous replication we call geo-replication, uh, which uh, you can use for, for DR and stuff like that. Um, practice practice self-healing. So if your node goes down and it comes back up, it will uh, proactively search out the data that is missing and, and replace it from the last known good uh, node. What can you do with it? Uh, lots of stuff. Uh, traditionally, we've been really good at the sort of the CDN sort of use case, the content delivery network. If you want to, if you need to host uh, a lot of videos and audio and documents on some sort of file server, file and document server, file and directory server. Um, we're a great way to do that. And we allow you to scale out as large as you need to. We have multiple petabyte deployments. Um, I think Harvard has a six petabyte deployment where they actually have, uh, they have life science data 
with it, which they use for genomic sequencing and stuff like that. So there, there are a lot of different use cases that you can use GoStarFest for. This is um, sort of a graphic of a, your standard deployment. This would be a distributed replicated setup. The most common setup is distributed replicated where you have you distribute it over multiple nodes, and then you've replicated those nodes um, entirely. And you can see, you know, it's pretty, conceptually it's pretty easy to grasp why you have like a distributed over multiple servers, and then you've uh, replicated them. I think we have like distributed and replicated backwards here, but either way you get the idea. Oh, and they, um, just so we're clear, GlusterFast is sort of a, um, it's an aggregate layer that's still on top, and uh, it works in conjunction with the file system below. So the, the, files, the disk file system we work with, uh, they have to support extended attributes, so this will include ext4, xfs. Uh, in some cases, people have used zfs, uh, although we recommend xfs. So, any questions so far? That last bullet point is going to be more and more important as we go forward. When we talk about multi-protocol access, you know, right now you can access a uh, Gluster volume via NFS v3, via the GlusterFS client, which mounts a volume over Fuse. Uh, now we're developing libgf API, which allows you to interact directly with Gluster volumes via the API and avoiding Fuse entirely, so you don't have to mount. Um, this is how we do the new uh, QMU integration, by the way. Um, we also have, you know, uh, uh, the Swift API access. And we, uh, as I mentioned, we have the HDFS access. As we go forward, we're going to allow all these. We're branching out to become this sort of unified data storage backend. So regardless of what you're doing, you'll be able to interact with your data you know, from whatever application you want to use. Um, we don't think it should be dictated to you how you access your data. You should be able to do it you know, using the best tool for the job. And then one of the things we, we really talk about, we really emphasize, is the sort of uh, global namespace. The fact that no matter what platform you're deploying on, it should look the same to you, to the end user, or to the application. Uh, it should behave the same, uh, whether you're deploying on a public cloud, on EC2, or you're de deploying on your you know, virtualized environment, or on your uh, you know, bare metal system. It, it should behave exactly the same. It should be able to work with the same applications, uh, and that sort of thing, and allow the same type of protocol access. So, so as I mentioned, when we started out, what we really set out to build was a storage toolkit. And then using the Transar API, you could use GlusterFS as a method for building new file systems on top of the, the platform that we built. Um, it was very hacker friendly. We were uh, very much uh, in the mode of you know, working with a set of developers uh, who were helping out with the project. Very externally focused. Uh, that's sort of how we got uh, our footing in the beginning. Um, because the community was an integral part of it. And we kind of lost our way after a couple of years and kind of uh, diverged from that. But over the last two years, especially ever since the Red Hat acquisition, uh, we've been uh, focusing more on that. And we've got some things coming up which uh, may interest you in that regard. So let's look at the most recent, um, the most recent uh, uh, GA release, 3.3. Is this echoing really badly? Tolerable, okay. Um, so what are the features that, what are the main features that were included in 3.3 that were made it different from previous releases? Uh, one thing is uh, granular locking. So what I mean by that is we had a bit of a difficulty in 3.2 and prior where if you had a server that went down and it came back up, uh, in order to do a self-heal, you would have to check um, uh, check the uh, uh, MD5 hashes uh, of the uh, uh, the file sizes of, the, or of the, each file, so it could determine what needed to be healed, and it would check the the hashes against each other, and then it would copy a file over um, to heal it. The problem was, if you had, say, for example, VM images, hundreds of them, on a Gluster server, and it went down, when the server comes back up, and you're doing these MD5 hash checks on on each of these several gigabyte uh, uh, VM images, it can lock up the machine and basically be a denial service for anyone who tries to use the servers for anything, to use that server for anything else, which is kind of not what you want to happen when you're, you know, running 
essential services that people rely on. So with 3.3, what we did was we changed the mechanism so that when you came back and you were checking to see what needed to be healed, you would go uh, block by block of each file instead of check something the entire file. And the effect was it was much easier and much less resource intensive to do it that way. So that's one of the things we instituted in the last release. Um, proactive self-healing, prior to 3.3, uh, it was a manual file system stat that would kick off a self-heal. Uh, now we sort of removed that entirely because we found that pending, self, pending heals would, would stick around for much longer than anyone should expect. Uh, improved rebalancing, I'll get into how that changes. Um, In-flight data encryption, I don't actually have a, a, an accompanying slide for that, but just know that um, you can, with 3.3, you can now, with uh, OpenSSL, you can uh, uh, encrypt your file, your encrypt your data from the uh, client uh, to the, the volume. Uh, and multiple access methods. I'll get into that in more detail. Um, first of all, granular locking. So this is sort of a graphic to sort of illustrate what I was saying. Uh, when, you, when, you block, when you compare the individual blocks of the files that are on the uh, uh, the replicated uh, volumes, and you're able to uh, check them bit by bit instead of the entire uh, file at once. Uh, practice self-healing. We keep a running index of some links that were, are the, um, the files that need to be uh, healed uh, so that when, a, uh, when one server goes down, we'll, we keep adding to that running list until the server comes back up, and then it checks that um, that uh, it checks the directory, I think it's .glustrfs directory, which is where these symlinks are stored, and it checks that directory to see which files it needs to copy over, and then that's how the self-heal kicks off. Um, easier rebalancing. So one of the things we realized was that we were, uh, we were doing rebalancing in a very inefficient method, using a very inefficient method. We were, instead of only moving, so is everyone clear on what a rebalance is? why you would do it. If you end up with files, too many uh, files in, in one server and, and not enough are distributed to the other servers, you end up with, sometimes you have to, uh, especially when you add a new server to the mix, you need to kick off rebalance so that it will distribute the files evenly over your, including your new server. Well, in the old method, it would, uh, it would move all files, uh, which was, ultimately, it would provide the right result, but the problem was you didn't have to actually do that to, to get to that result. And so what we would do was we would, we would calculate a new um, hash map to, uh, on how to distribute the files and we'd just sort of toss the old hash map away uh, and, and not really pay attention to what actually needed to change. Uh, with 3.3, the, the change that we implemented was such that we compared the old hash map to the new and then only moved the things that actually need to move. So this way it's easier to decommission servers, it's, it's easier to add new servers, um, much simpler uh, methodology. So unified file and object, this is where we get into the Swift API stuff, and uh, this is when I start talking about multi-protocol access uh, in addition to the NFS v3 server that we implemented uh, with GlusterFS. Um, the whole point behind this is that you're able to access your data uh, using whatever method you want. Um, and so how many of you have used S3? How many of you understand what the object storage stuff is? Okay, cool. Um, and Swift is the, the uh, OpenStack object storage pro uh, project. And uh, we basically took their API and we refactored it to use GlusterFS on the back end. So that now we can have you know, the, the object access over HTTP as well as you know, mounting over NFS or mounting with the GlusterFS client. And you have access to the same data. I actually have a demo of this running if, you, uh, if we have some time at the end and you want to see it. But the idea is, if you have applications that depend on POSIX level access, you, know, you can do that and still you're talking about the same data, so you don't have to worry about copying the data over to some other system and then running an application on it and then copying it back. You can just access the same data. So, your data your way. Uh, or as someone said, uh, uh, we're the Burger King of, of data, so. Um, HTFS compatibility, similar concept. Um, you about to say something? No. I'm no, okay. Not sure everybody knows what Burger King. <laughs> oh yeah. 
American Cultural References 101. All right, so, um, so HDFS uh, uh, is the file system, the default file system for Hadoop. Uh, Hadoop assumes that HDFS is running on the back end, and so we, we create a shim, a plugin, that basically fools Hadoop into thinking that it's writing to HDFS natively when it's really writing to our plugin, which then distributes the data on ClusterFS. Uh, it's conceptually it's the same as, as, what, as what unified file and object is, as in, you know, you should have data that is able to be accessed from your uh, regular tool, tool sets uh, in addition to Hadoop, and you shouldn't have to require different tools just to move data around to present it. So, how many of you are Hadoop users? One brave soul, okay. Um, so, there was a there's an article in the register where it said uh, Red Hat kicks HDFS to the curb. Don't pay attention to that. We're this is really complimentary. There are some cases there. In fact, there are many cases where HDFS is superior for what it does. This is really for just for cases where you you need data accessible to multiple applications. So, so now we get to the fun stuff that's coming up. So 3.3 was released in uh, I think the end of May uh, 2012 and 3.4 just entered alpha, and we're about to uh, enter beta with 3.4. Uh, so a lot of uh, fun stuff is coming up there. Um, most interestingly, this marks the first time for the first release where we have the premier feature coming from uh, you know, a non-team non, um, non engineer, um, whether for Gluster in the beginning or, or for Red Hat. Uh, this is the first time we've had the premier feature committed from, from outside of that sphere. In this case, it's from coming from IBM. Uh, IBM has uh, some guys working out of the Linux Technology Center in Bangalore, and they decided, they were on the QMU team, and they decided, well, we need a GlusterFS driver uh, for QMU. We should write it, but the problem is, you know, there's this, uh, there's this performance problem when you go through Fuse, and the random I.O. associated with VM images hosted on GlusterFS uh, doesn't perform so well. So we need to find a way out around that. One of our engineers had at one time uh, worked on a client library to bypass views, and so he res resurrected that project. Uh, and the IBM guys then also proceeded to write a block device translator that would sit on the GlusterFS server and could be uh, accessed uh, via QMU commands to uh, spin up new VMs, to manage VMs uh, hosted on GlusterFS. And the end result was, you know, so far, it looks like the uh, uh, performance is three times as fast as what we got previously. So it's significant, and it's a, it's a big deal. Not only is it a big deal because this is something that people have been asking for for a long, long time, but it's a big deal because it didn't come from us. It came from other people. I think it demonstrates sort of uh, how far we've come and how, uh, how large our influence has grown just over the last year or two. So it's a, it's a pretty, uh, pretty significant deal. Uh, it just entered alpha, I think, a week and a half ago, two weeks ago. We're expecting a beta to drop, hopefully tomorrow, right? <laughs> hopefully this week we'll have a, a beta to speak about. Um, but you can at least check out the alpha. You'll need Q, at least QMU 1.3 and libvirt. Um, well, actually, I don't think you'll actually need libvirt, but, but libvirt 1.0.1 uh, supports ClusterFS as well. Um, this sort of goes into some of the uh, detail behind that. Um, and we're talking about a, is a you know, native integration going through the libgf API, bypassing views. Um, so you, QMU talks to the Gluster volume, uh, and under the Gluster volume, you know, we hide the sort of the, the formats and we make it easy for QMU to deal with it directly. This gives you an idea of the um, specific uh, drive flag uh, for when you're uh, running the QMU command for specifying a Gluster disk on the back end. And again, the block device support is via the, the block device translator, which IBM also contributed. This sort of gives you a comparison between um, regular local QMU and QMU going over libgf API and uh, interacting with the Gluster FS back end. And you can see behind the, sitting below Gluster FS, you've got all the different translators that can uh, hide what kind of actual file type it is, um, because it shouldn't matter. 
Um, LibGIF API, as I've mentioned, is, uh, it was previously abandoned and then brought back to life because of the uh, QMU integration, which is great news. Um, but we're gonna go forward from there, and there's gonna be a lot more stuff going through LibGIF API in the future. Uh, we're talking about Samba integration. Um, UFO is gonna be uh, adapted to use LibGIF API. Uh, the HCFS shim is probably gonna be adapted to use LibGIF API. Basically, anything that's not scale out NAS, we're probably going to avoid using the, the Fuse module in the future and go with this guy uh, because it gives you better performance. And frankly, when you're talking about something that isn't scale at NAS, you don't really need the, the features of the Fuse module and the GlusterFS client to begin with. And so this sort of uh, marks a, a, new, uh, a new direction for us going forward and will uh, hopefully yield some very positive results. Um, some other things that are coming in uh, 3.4 are better ways to handle split brain. How do we, uh, how do we use quorum enforcement in uh, 3.4? How many of you have had to deal with split brains in the past? Okay, so in any sort of distributed computing environment, you always have the, the idea, the concept of, you know, a couple of different nodes. They don't know, for whatever reason, the connection is severed and they, they don't know that the other is still running. They think that the other is down. And so they each can continue to act as if they're the, the right one. And in a storage context, it means they're continuing to write data because they think that they're both um, you know, the, the, one, the only one that's functioning. And so whenever the connection is restored, you need a way to determine which one was you know, the right one or which, one, which way should the uh, data conflicts be resolved. And in some cases, you, you can't actually resolve it automatically. You have to do it manually. And in fact, a lot of uh, admins have told us you know, they're not going to, this is a configurable option, they're not going to use it because they'd much rather just do the, uh, endure the pain of resolving it manually. But um, what you can do now is you can have, uh, with 3.4, we're going to have a, an Arbiter node which serves no function except to determine quorum in cases of Replica 2. One of the problems we've had in the past is that if you're talking about only uh, one replicated set or a replica two model where you have, you know, an even number of uh, servers or an even number of replicas. It's very difficult to determine which one is right or which one is, is better than the other. Um, and it's impossible to determine quorum, as in which, in which way lies the majority. With the Arbiter node, you'll always have the ability to determine majority. Although this is actually incorrect because the Arbiter node isn't actually writing anything, but it's just there to determine uh, uh, which one should be writing. Uh, I believe it, uh, the configurable op option is such that uh, when it's set, it will, it will attempt to uh, stop uh, any writes going to the wrong node, assuming it can uh, connect with them. Um, and then after connection is restored, then self-heal is engaged in the right direction. Um, this goes into detail that I was already talking about. This is sort of what we're calling enhanced quorum. We had a bit of a quorum feature in uh, 3.3, uh, but it wasn't uh, to this degree of, uh, 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 didn't have the, uh, the same amount of functionality. And we had a slight problem in that in replica three setups, it, we, didn't, we weren't always consistent with data, so that was kind of a problem. And it kind of put the kibosh on any sort of uh, replica three setups with quorum. So how may I reach the, let me count the ways. Uh, we have a lot of different ways to interact with GlusterFS data, both on the control side or management side, as well as on the, the, the sheer data side. Uh, I've talked about translators. That's the probably the oldest way to, um, uh, to interact with the GlusterFS volume. It's the way we uh, implement core features. Uh, where there's a C API. It's fairly well documented, although the documentation around that isn't, um, that good, uh, although uh, we do have some, some documentation on glust.org. If you go to glust.org slash developers, you can find it. Um, as I mentioned, there's stackable um, asynchronous uh, I.O. throughout. Uh, we've also implemented some synchronous I.O. translators, but not, that's not a big part of it. Uh, the fuse mount, as I mentioned, um, if you have POSIX applications, you mount it over with a glustrfs client. Uh, and then the new libgf API, which bypasses fuse. Yes? On the client, does that look like just a, a device slash dev? I'm sorry? Is that just a, a device slash dev that QMU is opening and using? 
you were talking about the Glossopress client? The old, old live views, the WFA. Yeah, no, uh, it, um, yeah, that's, that was the purpose of, um, on the QMU side, when they implemented the, um, the driver into QMU, it, it's able to, to talk to the JPA, but it's not looking at, um, yeah, yeah. I think um, the block device driver presents a block device uh, via LibGF API, but I'm not sure how exactly QMU sees it presented. That's a good question. It's a pseudo block device for QMU. It's not a pseudo block device. Yeah, it's a real device that was prepared for it. It's not a real device. It's not something that shows up. It's not a file system. No. It's all internal to QMU. Um, and recently there were. Um, Recently, there were patches um, submitted upstream to Overt, so that uh, from Overt and soon through uh, Rev, you'll be able to do similar things, um, bypassing QMU, but it, it, the same type of functionality is implemented. So it will show up in the Overt interface as another block device you can use. Um, the marker framework, it's probably one of the great unsung heroes of GlustrFS. It's how we do our um, asynchronous replication. <clears throat> it's a running index of uh, files that have changed that uh, before we copy them over with rsync to the uh, uh, the uh, replicated volume. Uh, UFOs I mentioned, HDFS, and then uh, over it, the management API, which uh, which I was just talking about. Um, all of these ways are uh, more than half of these are new in that they've just been worked on, worked out in the last year and a half, two years. Um, Previous to 2011, uh, a lot of these didn't exist. We had the Transar API and we had the, the GlusterFS um, client, the fuse mount, and that was it. And then everything else here has appeared uh, since mid-2011. So as you can see, we've, we've significantly uh, increased the number of ways that you can interact with data to sort of um, carry our story about how we're you know, a unified data backend. Uh, getting into the uh, overt stuff, with the over at 3.1, it was allowed you to do simple um, create volume, uh, perform some si uh, simple functions with GlusterFS uh, on the back end. Uh, with 3.2, you can do some more things. Um, I can't remember if they, if they implemented a geo-replication from within over it, but I think that was on the roadmap. That's what was coming up soon. Um, but this, this gives you an easy way to manage your GlusterFS volume. So if, and if you, if you normally manage your virtualization with over it or rev, uh, then this this is just an, an added tab that lets you uh, you know, it lets you uh, uh, more easily uh, pick out which uh, uh, storage uh, types of storage you want to use on the back end. This is a screenshot. If you've seen over it, then you already know what this looks like. Um, multi tenancy and encryption. Uh, when uh, back in the day, uh, before we were acquired. Uh, there were two guys at Red Hat who looked at GlusterFS and implemented uh, something that they called HeckFS on top of it. And basically, it took GlusterFS and added encryption and then multi-tenancy for a cloud environment so that multiple clients could connect and not clobber each other's data. Um, the first part of that, the encryption, I already talked about because that's already been folded into um, mainline upstream GlusterFS. But the second part of that, the multi-tenancy, is coming uh, at some point it's probably, probably going to be in 3.5. It's not going to make it for this one, but I look for that to, to be added by the end of the year. Oh, those two guys are oh yes, sorry. So uh, Caleb, Caleb acquired me. He, uh, <laughs> yes, Jeff Darcy, yeah. So what's coming uh, after 3.4? 3.4 will be out probably in a month, but beyond that, we're looking at a variety of things, including what you see here. Multi-master geo replication. So we have asynchronous replication, which is master slave. So you've got your, your master volume, and it will always copy down to your uh, slave volume, which is write only or read only. Sorry. Uh, we're looking to make it so that you can have you know uh, multiple instances of uh, of geo replicated volumes that can each be written to. Um, snapshotting. We're looking at working in conjunction with uh, LVM, uh, being able to 
working with uh, uh, local snapshots and, and coordinating them somehow. Um, versioning, so you can do, you can have a, a go back to a specific version of a, a file or, or folder. Um, file compression, deduplication, standard sorts of things that, that everyone is trying to do with, with storage to, to make it not take up as much space. Right now, you know, we, our, our basic replication is just mirroring, and so anything we can do to shrink the, the amount of total uh, storage needed is, is a good thing, and so we'll be working towards that in the next year. Um, but in general, you know, beyond that, we're really looking at what are ways that we can help you analyze the data. You know, it's one thing to be able to store lots of data, but what can we help you do with it that will add value to you and, and what you're doing at your job? Um, you know, people right now, Hadoop is a big thing because people want to use this big honking MapReduce system to do batch processing. But what about all the other jobs, the 90% of data analytics that don't require something like Hadoop? Um, what about the ability to be able to use our extended attributes to, uh, to run jobs uh, using the extended attributes to find out data, find out more information about the data that you store? You know, these are the sorts of things that we want to enable so you can more easily build applications that take advantage of these features. Because so. um, in the end, you know, we want to make the storage intelligent enough to be able to work with your intelligent compute applications. And that's really what it's, it's all about, ultimately. So, that's it. Um, how am I doing on time? It's about two minutes. Oh, excellent. <laughs> Any questions for Caleb? So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, I see you. What are the most in, uh, interesting open source projects that built on top of Buffer and, uh, uh, Buffer and is there any kind of a CDN in a network like this open source project? Well, so, so the first, the, the, the first answer to that is HECFS is the most interesting um, project built on top of GhostRFS. There's another one, though, that just came up in the last, in the last couple of months. Um, it's a Ruby-based project called GF Locator. It actually uses the extended attributes to, to be able to find files. Because one of the great problems with distributed file systems is when you run your typical Unix commands like ls, find, it takes forever for those things to complete. But if you're able to implement these tools using the extended attributes and ways to quickly traverse the extended attributes uh, in the file trees, then you, you get you know, a return much more quickly than you would just through your standard find or ls. And I think GF Locator is one of the things that allows you to do that. I'm out of time. Do I have like two seconds for a quick question? No? Because somebody had their hand up in the back. I wanted to quickly. I, I don't have a time to answer that question. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you. Appreciate it.